Competitive gaming has and will be one of the most popular ways to play and spend time in the hobby. From League of Legends to Valorant, from Counter-Strike to Rainbow Six, from Tekken to Overwatch to Apex Legends, we love competition. We love testing ourselves, improving our skills, and having a system that recognizes that skill and validates that improvement. If you have a main game, it probably has a competitive mode or implements these systems in its matchmaking even if you don't play rank. But all of these things don't happen easily. Competitive systems are highly complex and fragile, and their application ranges from skill metric evaluations to the matchmaking systems, and they use terminology that can often confuse players. Terms from ELO to MMR or skill-based matchmaking. Well, hey, I'm Mug Thief, and join me in taking a deep dive into these systems to explain what they mean, how they work, and answer some critical questions. In this video, I'm going to show you some of the ways that matchmaking can hurt you, the ways that it helps you, and if some things like ELO Hell exist or not. The term ELO originated from the ELO rating system, which was first introduced by Arpad ELO, a Hungarian-American physics professor and chess player in the 1960s. It was designed to address the limitations of the United States Chess Federation's rating system, which relied on subjective assessments of player skill. The ELO rating system, instead, is a mathematical algorithm that calculates a player's skill level based on their performance in previous games against other rated players. It assigns a numerical rating to each player, with higher ratings indicating stronger players. The system works by adjusting a player's rating after each game based on the difference between their expected outcome and their actual outcome. If a player defeats a higher rated opponent, their rating will increase more than if they defeated a lower rated opponent. Since its introduction in chess, the ELO rating system has been adopted by numerous games and sports, including video games. The system is commonly used in multiplayer online games, where it facilitates matchmaking and ranking of players. In video games, the ELO system works by assigning each player an initial rating based on their performance in their first few games. The rating then adjusts after each subsequent game, based on the player's performance and the performance of their opponents. The system aims to match players with opponents of similar skill levels, providing a fair and competitive gaming experience. There are some variations of the ELO rating system used in video games such as True Skill, which was developed by Microsoft for Xbox Live and takes into account uncertainty in a player's skill level and adjusts ratings accordingly. Overall, the ELO rating system has become an essential tool for competitive gaming, providing a fair and objective way to measure and compare players' skill levels. Its widespread use in different games and sports is a testament to its effectiveness and versatility. Now, while the ELO rating system is widely used in video games and has proven effective in many cases, it is not without its criticisms. Some common complaints about the ELO system include the lack of transparency, where the ELO system is often opaque with players not knowing how their ratings are calculated or how much each game affects their rating. This lack of transparency can lead to confusion and frustration among players. It's also slow to adapt. The ELO system can take a while to adjust a player's rating to reflect their current skill level, particularly if they have experienced a significant improvement or decline in their performance, or for example have taken a recent break. This can lead to players being matched with opponents that are either too easy or too difficult resulting in unbalanced and unsatisfying gameplay. Then we have smurfing and boosting. The ELO system can be exploited by players who create new accounts or manipulate their matchmaking to face lower skilled opponents and artificially inflate their rating. This practice, known as smurfing or boosting, can create a distorted ranking system and make it more difficult for genuine players to progress and enjoy the game. And finally, the one-size-fits-all approach. The ELO system is a universal rating system that assumes all games and players are equal. However, different games and modes may require different rating systems or adjustments to better reflect the unique characteristics and player skill distribution. Despite these criticisms, the ELO rating system remains very popular and widely used in video games. Game developers and rating system designers 
continue to refine and improve the system to address these concerns and provide a more accurate and satisfying competitive experience for players. The term ELO HELL is a phrase that strikes fear into the hearts of competitive gamers around the world, and it's the state of being stuck at a certain ELO rating or rank and feeling completely helpless to climb higher. It's like quicksand, the more you struggle, the deeper you sink. Now picture this, you've been playing your favorite online game for hours, but no matter how hard you try, you just can't seem to win. You're stuck in a losing streak and it feels like the universe is against you. Your teammates are either inexperienced or downright toxic, and your opponents seem to be some kind of elite squad of gaming champions. You feel trapped, unable to break free from the cycle, and defeat the frustration. This phenomenon is known as ELO Hell, and it's a controversial topic in the world of competitive gaming. Some players believe that it's a real thing, while others argue that it's simply an excuse for poor performance. Regardless of where you fall on the spectrum, it's clear that the feelings of being stuck in ELO Hell are very real and a very frustrating experience for many players. One of the main reasons why players get stuck in ELO Hell is due to poor matchmaking algorithms. If you're matched with teammates who are either too inexperienced or too toxic, it can be difficult to win no matter how good you are. Conversely, if you're matched with opponents who are far more skilled than you, you're almost guaranteed to lose. This can result in a losing streak that's difficult to break out of, and it's easy to see why players feel helpless in these situations. To combat this, game developers have implemented a variety of measures to help players avoid ELO Hell. Some games have introduced stricter matchmaking algorithms, which try to match players based on their skill level and other factors such as player behavior. Others have implemented reward systems to incentivize positive player interactions and teamwork. Despite these efforts, however, the concept of ELO Hell remains a contentious issue among gamers. This often boils down to the fact that these pockets of ratings regularly force a feeling of dependency on luck. The potential combinations, ranging from toxic behavior, smurfs and boosters, incompetent or uninterested teammates, and a simply wider range of variation in skill due to the higher concentration of players in that rating, from people who naturally have less interest in their rating, creating a vortex where it's difficult to play a normal match without any of these elements being present. The frequent offhand comment that we hear, especially from figures such as high-ranked streamers, is that if you encounter these negatives on your team or positives on the opponents, you have the same chance of the opposite to be true. So the scales are balanced, and it's your performance that will ultimately be the constant that allows you to climb. This on paper sounds like a very convincing argument, especially when said as a blanket throwaway statement. But the truth of how these systems intersect and the theory of how they function are often valued as truths instead of as the rules in which a player then has to actually play and experience the game. While the merits of these systems can be discussed up and down, we ignore all too often the experience that these players have to endure, and how they inevitably end up promoting the same negative behavior that many complain about in the first place. You would be hard pressed to find a player in environments with high levels of toxicity that hasn't ever done it as well even if to a lesser degree. I'm going to attempt to break down all of the problems that lead into the struggles of matchmaking and explore the difficulties that players face as well as the potential solutions that developers could implement to resolve them. But before I do, remember that if you're enjoying this video, you should leave a like or even subscribe. You also have handy chapters since the video can be a little bit long and maybe you want to take a break and come back right where you left it. With that said, let's get into it. I've said many times over the course of my life that being president of a country must be one of the worst possible jobs you could have. Imagine waking up each day with the weight of decisions that can significantly affect the lives of millions upon millions of people and having the final say on many of them. It doesn't matter how much you weigh the pros and cons of any decision you make or how much it will benefit some. The truth is that it doesn't matter how carefully balanced you take your decisions, in the best case, you still have anywhere from 30 to 50% of the population attack and hate you for making it. You will never win and you will never make everyone happy. You can only try to make the majority happy and to lose less. It wasn't until I began researching this video 
that I noticed that this is the same for many game developers working on competitive systems. As players, we are baffled by the performance or behavior of players that are somehow considered to be in our skill level. We will often encounter people who lack basic mechanics to the point where if this were a race, they haven't learned how to crawl. We will experience extreme toxicity with helpings of racism, misogyny, and homophobia sprinkled with aggression and threats. We will encounter players who simply dominate, destroying all opposition as if an adult were playing football against children. And then we will wonder how this person can continue to exist in the same lobbies as us. But we only have that single time, that one match, that unique perspective. This could be a standout performance, an outlier. They were drunk, they were tryharding, their cousin decided to play a match on their account, or they reached the tipping point and began to say things that they've never said before. We can't blame the system for these variables that simply can't be predicted. And although some of these could definitely be grounds for severe punishment, it can't be that black and white, and everyone deserves a second chance. Especially when they are a paying or potentially paying customer. As much as pruning the experience to players who take the game seriously and trying to foster a good environment sounds wonderful, the reality of a business is that you need as many customers as possible, because this is, at the end of the day, a business. Some games try to address this with systems such as a separate queue, allowing these players to continue playing, but in lobbies filled with similarly inconsistent players with bad conduct, but retaining the players themselves as customers. These systems, however, tend to be opaque. You can't really know if you're unlucky or you're in the secondary queue. We don't know where the line is in performance or how many times you have to say horrible things nor how horrible they can be before you are punished. And some bad actors make it a mission to find this out and live right on the limit. Finding that limit usually requires the use of something called inting, which is short for intentional feeding. This is when a player decides to give up and make their performance worse, often letting themselves lose or having a negative impact. Sometimes this is as simple as not playing, called going AFK or away from keyboard, or playing to lose by walking up to an opponent and allowing them to win, and in the worst cases, actively attempting to make their team lose, using abilities or exploits to bother their allies or helping the enemy team by revealing positions or aiding them in their objective. It's generally easy to spot this, especially as matchmaking and evaluation systems get better at analyzing performances. And this is one of those offenses that gets swiftly and brutally punished. But this simply gave rise to something new. Soft inting. As you might guess from the name, this is where you accomplish any of the above, but trying to convince the systems that you are just having a very bad game. You pretend to play, but you miss all your abilities or shots. You grossly misposition or make decisions that you know will lead to a negative outcome, but that could be logical and count as playing the game to the algorithms. It's just done very badly. Theoretically, this could confuse the analysis, but you will still get reported manually by other players. However, how can an automatic system be confident that you're the bad actor and that it isn't all the other teammates that are being unreasonable and behaving toxically towards a person simply having a bad game? This can be taken to even worse extremes, where the person soft inting will communicate in a calm, kind, even helpful demeanor while the teammates logically become enraged and potentially begin to flame them, or in other words, saying toxic and horrible things to them. In these cases, the system will side even more with giving the inter the benefit of the doubt. He has apologized, collaborated, and communicated while his teammates have insulted and demeaned them for simply having a bad game. You could even end up being punished for attacking the person who is purposefully trying to ruin your match and playing the nice guy while they do it. But what solutions does this have? While games like League of Legends claim to implement very complex systems that can detect if a person is soft inting, but they still warn you that you should keep your cool at all times. Not only is that a big ask of a normal person who just logged in and found themselves wasting a half hour or more of their precious free time in this situation, 
but the expectation that they should remain calm when they will not be compensated is frankly ridiculous. You have to be nice, stay calm, report them, but you will still lose the match and suffer the consequences of that result with no compensation. And you still have to actively try and win despite these circumstances or risk receiving punishment yourself. Easy solutions for this problem could include a guarantee that if a player is found guilty of this specific behavior, that match will be effectively refunded to the rest of the players. As if it never happened. This could incentivize players by creating an only win situation. If you win despite the bad actor, you get your points as you normally would. But if you lose, nothing happens. A free try at the slot machine. The other would be that if a bad actor is detected at any point, the team should receive the option to abandon the game with no penalty as to at least not waste their time. This last one is controversial as it could be abused in situation related to disconnects. If you're playing with friends, one of them could disconnect, take the punishment, and the rest could leave without taking the loss. But I don't believe that this should be applied for simple disconnects. That's a different issue entirely. This should be applied for people actively attempting to ruin games, and if it isn't detected as such, you should be allowed to continue, primarily because in the case of disconnects, the person is normally automatically punished to a higher or lower level. But as I mentioned before, this is always a balancing act. If you have a power outage or your internet disconnects, you will be punished the same as someone raging or attempting to ruin the game, because the system can't know if you had an accident or are trying to grief other people. Once again, I think that situations like these should be investigated further. In my experience over way too many hours, and I bet most of you will agree, legitimate disconnects tend to be easy to identify and often forgiven by other players on simple empathy. Someone is playing well, communicating, trying to win, and suddenly disconnects. Easy to distinguish from others who will frequently stop playing well, start practices similar to inting, or say some heinous shit in chat, and then disconnect. Before administering a punishment for disconnecting, these factors should be examined and siding on the benefit of the doubt with punishments doled out for repeat offenses. So hey, it's only because people are vengeful evil beings then. Well, kind of. There are other errors in the system, primarily in the accuracy of ratings, which compounds with the flexibility of these systems. You're probably not aware of the depth of analysis that these systems conduct. Speaking with friends, players, and just examining the general internet, there seems to be a misconception that the metrics that determine your skill or elo bracket are simple factors, such as winning or losing, your KDA or kill death assist ratio, or other quantifiable metrics depending on the game, ranging from things like shots on target in FPS games to gold income or creep score in MOBAs, or purchase decisions in Valorant or Counter-Strike. Those are all definitely measured, don't get me wrong, and often publicly shown to you. But if you've ever used a third-party analysis application that starts showing other statistics and comparisons to other players, that is also only a fraction of the data that these games collect to analyze your performance. I have personally tried and failed to make smurfs or fake low skill accounts low enough in order to play with friends, and even when purposefully playing worse, I failed, and this is because I underestimated the analysis of these systems. In FPS games, it will analyze movement paths at what moment, adaptations to situations, angles taken, decisions such as peaking and re-peaking, reaction speed, inputs per minute, crosshair positioning, and it can even measure map knowledge. Pretty much everything you do is analyzed and compared to players across the entire spectrum to determine your initial position. This lends a lot of credibility to something I hear often. The systems are, in broad terms, quite precise and correct. Even if you believe you don't belong in a certain bracket, the system will know better than you in a very high percentage of cases. But it's the weight placed on what elements that frequently leads to strange situations. Not right or wrong, but simply edge cases. In a game like Overwatch, where positioning, team coordination, and ability use are crucial to winning, a player that never uses their abilities, or is inefficient at understanding and utilizing their ultimate, 
would naturally be considered a low-skill player. But they could also have 20,000 hours in Counter-Strike and be a wizard at aiming, obtaining eliminations and consistent victories. What should the system do? Should it allow this player to continue climbing, encountering allies and players that focus on coordinated play, maximizing their character choices, until these elements lead to them losing and force them to adapt? During that entire hypothetical climb, as they reach higher skill brackets, their allies will gradually be more and more upset at this player's performance, where their perfect aim is simply not enough to win and having a teammate that doesn't use core elements of the game makes them feel like they're being trolled and they're losing because this player on their team is simply not equipped to be their teammate. But the system detects that they have amazing aim and can win consistently. Should it leave this player in a lower bracket where their raw aim is enough to destroy lower skill opponents? They won't learn anything nor adapt since they don't need to and they will feel terrible since they win but don't climb. And their opponents will feel like matchmaking is stacked against them with an opponent that feels invincible. Once again, it's a difficult balancing act that leads to frustration at every turn and where nobody is ever truly happy. But these sorts of edge cases happen all the time, especially the more complex and flexible that a game is. In a game like a battle royale, where win conditions are not exclusively eliminating opponents and hiding and moving well can be enough to reach high positions, this skill adjustment becomes exponentially more complex in what things to reward and which should hold someone back. And at what point, without mentioning other factors in a game such as Apex, that combines enormous maps, multiple of them in fact, with distinct characters that have important abilities and demanding shooting and movement mechanics that all fit into a large flexible battle royale system. In something like League of Legends, you have constants such as the map, but the vast array of characters, builds, and strategies that can all lead to victory mean that the potential decisions a player can make at any moment are very high and difficult to evaluate and summarize into a skill rating. League specifically benefits from an absurdly high player count to contrast data with, but not every game has that benefit. So this means that there are logical limitations to these systems, but they work a majority of the time. But before we talk about why they don't, and where the critical failure point occurs, it's worth mentioning that a lot of this could be alleviated with more transparency and player guidance. It shouldn't be difficult to present the player in an escalating fashion with some of the in-depth data that they collect and present it in a fashion that explains to the player why they are where they are and what aspects they should focus on to improve without the need of seeking third-party applications, YouTube guides, or Twitch streams. The game itself can detect what a player lacks and it can teach them mechanics that they don't have from positioning to crosshair placement to ability usage and show them statistics of how improving in those areas could help them climb. So let's go on to the big one. What is ELO Hell? Until now, despite everything having clear cases that would help the overall experience, it seems that these deeply complex systems work as intended and give positive results more often than not. So how is it possible that so many people complain and feel frustrated? often a disproportionate amount even considering them a vocal minority. This can't be simply a question of optics. What is actually happening here? For starters, there is a perfect storm where you can be put into matches where there are edge cases of player placement and also bad actors, griefers, enters, flamers, or just assholes, and all this before putting in other factors such as cheating. But that sounds impossible. How could that happen? Well, what if I told you there's a place where this is not only possible, but it happens amazingly often? Welcome to ELO Hell. All of these systems in place, but there's one element of it that's simply impossible to control, and that in combination with all these systems has generated a perpetual cycle that traps players in a system that feeds into constantly making the conditions worse and pushes people into being another part of the problem, 
slowly turning regular players into griefers, much like an infection can spread all over the world, causing us all to be locked in- Whoa. Okay, yeah. Like a zombie infection. Let's leave it there. So let's take a step back and examine a different concept that's necessary to understand the low hell, and that is rank distribution. The name could be misleading, since this doesn't apply only to ranks. It doesn't matter what your rank is in most competitive games with ranking systems. What matters is your underlying matchmaking rating, or MMR. This is what determines your skill bracket, and it applies to a higher or lesser degree throughout the entire game, and it's determined using those metrics that we spoke about before. The skill-based matchmaking leads into other conversations in games like Call of Duty where, with the intention of having player retention, the game violently oscillates based on recent performance to find players in your skill range. You could dominate a lobby and the next game be absolutely stomped as the game continuously adjusts for each and every match. But fundamentally, Call of Duty applies this to the entire game, not just in their terrible ranked modes. This casual experience is aggressively tuned to this. Recently, Overwatch developers explained that their system for matchmaking is identical in ranked and quick play, which is the casual unranked mode, but with more leniency allowing slightly larger skill discrepancies between the players. It didn't take long for the impact to be felt and unranked to feel very, very similar to the ranked experience. The point is, even if you never touch a ranked mode, these systems are applied to every player to theoretically improve the quality of each match. So when I speak about ranks, keep in mind that even if you don't play ranked and don't even have an assigned rank, the system underneath has labeled you with one with the purpose of matchmaking. Rank distribution is simply what percentage of players are in each rank. Traditionally, there will be a very low concentration in the absolute lowest ranks, with some games like Valorant or Apex introducing ranks like Iron and Rookie, designed for players who are completely new and still learning the game. In essence, a protected bracket for players to learn without being scared away by the chaos that will inevitably follow in a more open pool. And these ranks normally contain between 5 to 10% of players, but they're all rapidly shifted upwards and repopulated with new ones. Bronze features a large concentration, normally between 20 to 30% of players depending on the game, but the biggest rank is silver, holding anywhere between 25 to 35% of players, and gold holding the same amount as bronze or a little more. This means the largest concentration of players is found at the split between silver and gold, where depending on the rigidity of the systems, a silver player could find themselves with the ability to be matched with 70 to 80% of the entire player base on any given match. This lends credibility to the idea that once you're out of gold or in diamond, the game changes. People in these ranks, the top 30 to 20 or 15 to 10 percent, are playing a completely different game, where things are taken much more seriously, unspoken rules and tactics are in place, and games unfold very differently from the lower ranks. This naturally creates a rough transition period towards the tail end of gold or platinum, depending on the game one that many people simply can't overcome and find themselves stuck in gold or platinum fluctuating and sometimes dipping lower for years. So, if in their majority, players in the top percentiles are taking the game seriously, care about their rank, and are more willing to put differences and feelings aside to win and preserve those ranks, what can we find immediately below this echelon? Well, I'm sorry to say, but... Let's imagine for a second that you're a relatively new player to a competitive game. You've been playing for about four to six months, learning, enjoying your experience and steadily improving. You invest your free time in the game because it's fun, exciting and satisfying to improve and feel that improvement as you understand more and more of the game. You find yourself in the middle ranks of gold and you've encountered a bit of a wall where it's difficult to advance but you're confident that you can improve more and keep progressing. However, you begin to notice that a lot of your games are extremely one-sided. Often, they're decided by which team has someone disconnecting, inting, 
griefing or with massive differences in skills amongst players on the teams. Even when you win under these conditions, it doesn't feel satisfying. You only feel relief that at least you didn't end up on the losing side and watching your points drop. All of this is disheartening and feels like a waste of time each time it happens. And your progress is halted, but you want to keep pushing. Let's stop and examine the people around you. Why are these behaviors popping up so much more often than before? With a large degree of randomness, up to 80% of the player base can be in the same match that you're in. Many of these players don't care. They don't take the game seriously, be it because they're not invested or they've been in the same position for so long that they've stopped caring. Others have gotten frustrated and turned to toxic behavior with weak mental fortitude where they give up or flame their teammates at a moment's notice and they will decide before the game begins that they will try to make the game unwinnable because of a champion or hero someone picked. Others are so angry that they queue up exclusively to ruin the experience for others. Some of them cling to hope, but are quick to decide that a game is lost and resort to soft inting just to make the game end faster. Others have resorted to tactics such as smurfing or boosting to get out or to get their friends out, creating imbalances in the matches they are in. Others simply pay for cheats, either out of anger or desperation but they create even more blatant imbalances that feel even worse to play against. And while sure, a large portion of players are the same as you, another portion is not. And in a 5v5 game, all it takes is one out of every 10 to disrupt the system. And those odds are not really amazing. All you need is one of those 10 to be in that population of disruptors. If you are still mentally there, one of nine, since you and hopefully your friends don't count, and even then, it's still scary. But that isn't the problem. The biggest problem is how normal players end up becoming toxic. Losing hope, fragile with weak mental, easily triggered, and no longer care about winning or losing. The easiest way for this to happen is to be surrounded by this atmosphere. This feeling of being trapped in unfun circumstances where you gain nothing of value, and the odds are just continually stacked against you. Elo Hell, simply put, is a confluence of circumstances that is predictable, logical, and worst of all, the longer that more and more people play a game at a specific level, the larger and larger that black hole grows, sucking in more victims and soldiers into their cause. The common phrase, skill issue. If you're good enough, you can climb. A phrase that ignores the impact that all these negative elements can have on a team game. But worse than that is how this binary distinction, as if a human were a machine that simply needs to improve, is the biggest mistake that leads to the idea of ELO hell being a myth. The real problem is in the player experience. A player in this situation, like our hypothetical mid-gold new player, now has to suffer through this, possibly get stuck in this, or stop enjoying the game altogether. Even if they are good enough to break out, there will be an almost inevitable speed bump and negative experiences in this key part of their player journey. Even worse is that many of the most enjoyable parts of a game are found when those unwritten rules of higher ranks are introduced and people are trying their best to win. But we have systems that instead of teaching people and helping them reach that, foster toxicity and allow players to get stuck without improvement. Why would we even have a ranking system if it isn't with the objective to climb? I promised I would be offering solutions for these problems and this is the biggest one and it is possibly unsolvable. But I do have one idea. Not only should our systems be more efficient at detecting truly bad actors and our tools for learning more transparent and upfront, but a ranking distribution needs to change. The randomness is the problem. There needs to be more scalability, more ranks to group up players and make transitions, as well as keep that feeling of progress more cohesive and constant. Introducing an additional rank between gold and platinum or silver and gold could help create barriers, alleviate the feeling of being stuck and smooth out the requirements that the system looks for in order for people to climb and put them in lobbies where they can learn 
more consistently without all that RNG. This of course would require changes to matchmaking systems, and could cause longer queue times for games, even highly populated ones, and this is one of the things that developers often speak about. There is no one-to-one -one factor, increasing the queue doesn't improve the match quality by the same percentage. But I argue that there is an optimal calculation to be made if we add divisions precisely in the areas that already contain the highest amount of players. The fact is that we have spoken over and over about unfair matchmaking that leads to unfun experiences. There is definitely a bias, where we hear more from people essentially bragging about how they managed to break out of their elo bracket and are quick in labeling those that complain as unskilled or ill-equipped to escape but all we're really doing is ignoring the flaws in the system. I personally don't believe that it is as bad as some people make it out to be, but there is undeniably a problem. A high concentration of players with inefficient detection methods, not enough punishments for people who are bad actors, and unfair compensation for people who get dragged into their games, and the very real fact that long-term exposure to these environments makes players resent the game, lose motivation, create unhealthy relationships with a the game they love, and possibly become bad actors themselves. Compared to other systems in games, such as Call of Duty skill-based retention maximizing matchmaking, or gotcha mechanics, or games that have insidious models to promote pay to win, I doubt that this is what developers want for their general matchmaking. I don't think there is a conspiracy that this is what they want to achieve because it somehow increases profits. I think this is just a limitation of how impossibly complex matchmaking systems are. Hopefully, they improve and evolve in a way that avoids this situation from happening. More happy players and moving the average rank distribution upwards can only be positive for a game. It would make lower skilled players believe that climbing is possible no matter what and keep them happy and playing the game with a positive attitude. More players would be ranked higher according to those in-game metrics, leading to more high-quality competitive games where people are truly utilizing all the mechanics and nuances present. And both of those lead to more engaged players who enjoy their time and are more likely to interact with the game economy and spend money on it. We shouldn't have people complaining about ELO Hell because it doesn't matter if you believe in it or not. Every time someone mentions it, that's a person who is struggling to find enjoyment in a game they love, and something is not working as intended. I hope to have been entertaining and helped you learn something over the course of this video. This video took a lot of effort to create, from rewriting the script multiple times, to capturing footage from games, to research and finding all the sources you've seen on screen throughout the video. I love creating content, and it would make my day if you left a like, commented what you thought below, shared this video with people, or even subscribed to the channel if you want to see what's coming next. All those things help the channel reach more people and empower me to keep making great content. I've been Mug Thief, and y'all have a great day now.